Welcome to Raiders Roundtable, presented by America First Credit Union. That's Q Myers. I'm JT. Lincoln Kennedy in a little bit as we get you set for the Denver Broncos coming up. But the silver and black dropped to the Colts 25-20 to at Allegiant Stadium this past Sunday. And Q will jump right into the loss. And they all hurt, but that was a big one. They, yeah. they were set up to win that game. They're playing the game at home. The Jeff Saturday story was a big story leading up to it. And we thought the Raiders would be ready, but another slow start as right. they dropped 10 nothing right out of the gate. Yeah, that was it right there. And, and all week long, it really seemed like, you know, it was set up for the Raiders to, to get a nice little victory at home in front of the home fans and just not being able to get out of the gates on fire or coming out strong. They just really, you know, were slow. They had some penalties. They got them behind the sticks early and just weren't able to get anything going. And, you know, I think also with the start of Matt Ryan for the Colts, that kind of threw him for a loop as well because that was something we hadn't heard about all week long. Well, that, I thought that was the key to the game is Matt Ryan playing because it was the right thing to do. First, Jeff Saturday had to make a decision to go back to the owner, and the owner – has been making all the big decisions, even with personnel. Right. For Jeff Saturday to say, if we want to win this game, and Mr. Ursay, you want to win this game, we're going to go with our best player. And they right. did. And Matt Ryan was the best player. He's a future Hall of Famer, in my opinion. He played in the Super Bowl. He's got an MVP. His yards, his completions, his touchdowns are enormous in this league. And I thought he was the difference at the line of scrimmage. He calmed everything right. down for the Colts so they could get Jonathan Taylor going again in a passing game. And I think what he really did is calm upstairs. You know, Parks Frazier was the first-time offensive coordinator. He's the first-time calling right. plays. And I think that having that veteran presence at the line of scrimmage also helped calm him down and say, hey, Things are going to be all right. Let me know what you want me to run. We'll run it to the best of our ability. So I do think if that had been Sam Ellinger, it would have been a different ball game. Uh, Matt Ryan, obviously, is a pro's pro, has been there, done that. So he helped Parks Frazier get into the rhythm of calling plays, and so that was a big key as well. Well, Coach McDaniels mentioned it. What they were trying to do is make sure Jonathan Taylor didn't have a big play, and right. he had a monster big play. Matt Ryan had a big play running the football. They had a couple of big passes over the middle of the field. We say it again here on Raiders Roundtable, the middle of the field is Wide just open. a problem on defense. And yep. the Raiders are trying to mix and match some personnel. Some players aren't healthy enough to play. Some aren't coming back. There's some healthy scratches we'll talk about with Lincoln Kennedy. And it just seems like the personnel on defense, especially anywhere from 10 to 20 yards in that Bermuda Triangle of right. this defense is really getting stung every week. It felt like to me that the defense, uh, Patrick Graham tried to simplify it, like a lot of people call for, simplify the defense. Guys are thinking too much. It seemed like it was so simplified that Matt Ryan, again, going back to him being a pro and a veteran, was able just to pick him apart pretty easily. Saw what they were able to do, and with the guys that were out there, as you mentioned, you know, the personnel was a little bit different. You saw Masterson out there. You saw a lot of Darian Butler out there. Those guys aren't good enough to be able to react quickly and, and overcome a vanilla the defense you know sometimes that defense has to be complex to confuse the offense a little bit and it didn't confuse the Colts at all we just saw a Foster Moreau touchdown and I want to say this about Devontae Devontae is a beast yes okay he's Big an time. absolute beast and one of the things we want to accomplish on this podcast is we're trying to win games every week the organization wants to win Obviously, everybody who tunes in knows that they're evaluating players going forward. Mm -hmm. Devontae has delivered. Yes. And the big issue big is time. with fans are saying, well, keep going to Devontae. He gets targeted all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time he gets targeted. If there's a player or two where he's supposed to get the ball and he doesn't, it seems like a lot of people get upset about that. But I'll tell you, the couple of short passes to him mm -hmm. and him rushing to the marker and right. busting through that's people, huge. that's huge. the future of the Raiders. Yep. That's a player that the Raiders targeted because they need him. Like you've seen on this play, look at the extra yards stretching right. out. This is a performer. This is an entertainer. This is an athlete who wants to deliver for the fans. No, he really does. And he puts his body on the line every single play. I mean, you, again, he might be – it might be third in, in 12 and and he, you know, gets a five-yard catch and then he'll – run and run through people he, he will. to make sure that he gets that. And even on his touchdown catch and run, I mean, that was really a lot of him afterwards and making sure I'm going to get in the end zone. I'm going to dive into the end zone. There's not going to be a first and goal. I'm making sure that this happens. And that's the extra effort. And that's really the effort that you need to see from all the players. You know, everyone's not going to do it at the same level mm -hmm. of a Devontae Adams, but you can sure give that same effort and say, you know what? We need 10 yards. I'm going to get 12. Well, I think they're prepping for that every week. I really right. believe I that. Agree. And everybody knows that who's inside this building. The preparation 
is key, but we're sensing now that everybody's got to go all in and mm-hmm. everybody's got to take their preparation to the next level because the preparation is one thing. The execution right. has been the issue this year. It hasn't Other, translated yet from yeah. the practice field to the game consistently. Well, there's been mistakes. I mean, yeah. you and I talked about the pre-snap penalties on Raider Nation Radio. You can't start off a drive when the Raiders, for the first time in Derek Carr's career, didn't have a completion in a quarter. When right. they started that slowly, you, they didn't prepare for that. They no. prepared to start fast, and something happened, and the pre-snap penalties – as Derek could make a play right here as he's moving up in the pocket, they got to clean that up. And yeah. that's got to be cleaned up by the captains, the veterans, and even the backups when they get their opportunity to step in. Right. They just can't have those penalties. And, you know, it's something that was a big emphasis in training camp. It was oh, a huge was it? emphasis in preseason. Oh. I mean, that was something that you heard. And it made me happy because I thought, all right, this is going to be a very disciplined Raiders team. You know, they're not going to have a bunch of the dumb penalties shooting themselves in the foot, right? We heard that all whole time. Don't beat yourself. Make the other team beat you. Well, those pre snap penalties. Like you're mentioning, that makes you be at what third and thirty. You're not gonna, you're not going to win games. And like we're that. looking at the Matt Ryan play where he just ran, and there was some mistackling and some yeah. blown assignments on that play. Right. So again, you don't really put a spy on Matt Ryan, but right after, you know, after certain plays where the Raiders didn't fall on a fumble. Right didn't fall on a fumble, the yep. next play can't be a touchdown. No, and that happens. Okay, so, that it's, can't happen. It's so funny, though. That happens in baseball. You're a big baseball fan. Yeah. You know, if you give another team an extra out, what happens? It burns you every time. That's what happened in that play with Darian Butler not falling on the fumble. Very next play, touchdown. This is not a podcast that makes excuses. We don't. We, right. we think we hit it pretty hard here. And I'll tell you the two plays, not falling on the fumble, mm-hmm. which hurt, and Foster Moreau not being able to handle right. and hold on to that touchdown here. Look, it's a sixth one-score loss. What does that mean? Yeah, they're two and seven, right. and a lot of the losses are close. And as we do this on the radio and on this podcast, we try to stay encouraged about what could happen here. No one's encouraged with the loss. No. And, I, and what I've noticed as we've talked about this as friends on and off the air is the tight losses that you're supposed to win hurt more. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. These, this isn't they're, a, they're right there. Yeah, this isn't a yeah. team losing 42 to 17. Right. If you throw out the New Orleans game, every game they've had the ball to win the game mm-hmm. or have an opportunity to tie the game up late in the game. And that's what happened here. And I'll tell you this, Q, and I've been saying this, I thought that the Colts were the better team. I thought they played a better game. Right. They made many more plays, mm-hmm. but the Raiders could have stole that that game right at the end on their home field and it's just a game of inches it really is and that's what it is it always every game really comes down to one or two major, major plays and again that Darian Butler not jumping on the the fumble uh, that's what you got to do you have to jump on it and the, there's a difference between really good teams and teams that have a two and seven record the teams that are really good make that play yeah. the teams that don't you know that they, they don't have that record and again it's something that they have to learn they're learning the the process of completing everything and having attention to detail to every single play and on that one you know he tried to score instead of just getting the ball. I'm really disappointed that Daniel Carlson isn't playing a factor here. Mm -hmm. I mean, at all, because they're not getting him in field goal range. So there's a lot of opportunities. If you look at the stats here coming up, I mean, the stats, really, the 207 rushing yards, but I think that Carlson, I always say he needs about 12 points a game. Mm -hmm. Three field goals to get us to nine, three extra points. And Carlson's uh, one of the great weapons on this team. He hasn't been able to get going. The Raiders played a clean game with no turnovers in this game, but look at the penalties again. Double digit for 74 yards. And Q, they seem to be big penalties at the worst possible time. At the worst time. time. At the worst time. They'll have a big play and it'll get called back. Or, you know, they'll be getting ready to set up for a big play and it looks like they're lined up for a good play. And then, like, you said uh, a pre-snap penalty holding at the worst time I mean they're they're usually the big ones and you know it's just it just can't happen tripping right I mean I, I feel like I heard tripping multiple times on Sunday you hardly ever hear that in the game well there's a couple of moments in the game where the Raiders really put something together and we mentioned it was Devontae if they're trying to run it this year we've seen the positives with Josh Jacobs the maturing of the offensive line here but the defense has been part of the problem. We're going to have Lincoln Kennedy coming up here in a little bit, and Lincoln can tell you his perspective as a former Pro Bowler of what the struggles are on offense, those pre-snap penalties, and what to do on defense going forward with the personnel that the Raiders have as we continue on Raiders Roundtable. When you're a part of a team, there are expectations. And one of the things I expect from my team is trust. I work hard to win, and I trust my team to work hard too. That's why I feel good about America First Credit Union. They're my financial team, and I trust that they'll always be there for me and my community. I'm Hunter Renfro. Join me and the America First team today. 
60 years in the making, the Raiders now have a permanent place to call home, and the doors are open to get a world-class behind-the-scenes tour of their new home. An attraction unlike any other in Las Vegas, Allegiant Stadium. The Las Vegas Raiders invite you to experience the expertly guided tour that includes exclusive access to areas restricted to only football players, coaches, and staff. For more information, visit AllegiantStadium.com forward slash tours. We're back on Raiders Roundtable, brought to you by America First Credit Union. I'm JT. That's Q Myers and Lincoln Kennedy, kind enough to join us, our teammate here. And Lincoln, we usually begin with you. Big picture. You knew Jeff Saturday. You know him. You saw what he had coming in. You knew the team would be ready to go. What did you think of the Raiders' overall performance and how the Colts got the win in Vegas? Well, it, it, first of all, good morning, guys. It, it's disappointing. The the obviously the Raiders not being able to come with a win, uh, come away with the win. The Colts to me are an average team, but they played strong. And you knew it was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. I knew they were going to play animated for for Jeff Saturday. There's a lot of former players and, and coaches who've got experience that can generate or can motivate men. So I knew they were going to have a come out with a, a decent game plan. Uh, I, I just thought the Raiders were a better team that would be able to take advantage of them, and it just didn't happen uh, continuously because the Raiders struggled, especially in that first quarter when they went 3-3 three, three and outs. How big of it? Uh, uh, how big do you think it was that Matt Ryan got the start and nobody really in, had talked about it and known about it and prepared for it? Not surprised because when Jeff Saturday took over the job, to me, he goes in the locker room. He just wants to make everything right. For whatever reason, Matt was benched, and the Colts and Frank Wright at the time would decide to move on with Sam Ellinger. Um, you know, well, that's probably the future. No one's taking that away. But for here and now, players want to win. So they want to put the best players out there. Sam uh, struggled mightily in this time out there. Matt Ryan is probably arguably a future Hall of Famer, and he has the know-how and the, and the way uh, within this game scheme that they've had to, to implement it. And he did it you know, almost perfectly, um, especially with the running game. So, you know, it, it's unusual to see Matt Ryan running the RPO, but it worked <laughs> his advantage because he had his longest run of his career with 36 yards. Lincoln, what did you think of the Raiders' pre-snap penalties, something we've been talking about? They had a clean preseason. We know that Josh McDaniels cares about this, and he he's a detail-oriented guy, so he's got to be in everyone's head about that. Why is that a problem here as the Raiders had 10 penalties? The lack of discipline comes from lack of focus and con concentration, and it's the beginning, to me, of guys of things going wrong in the wrong area. And what I mean by that is individual concentration, individual, you know, um, uh, individuals out there have to be accountable for their deeds and what they're doing and what they're executing. You have guys jumping off sides, you have guys creating penalties or whatever it is. That's that's unforced errors. Those are mental errors. And, and if you're focused and you're concentrating, you're focused on the goal. Those things don't likely happen. We saw the preseason how clean they were, but we also seen recently how, you know, this last couple of months, how they're beginning to, to count up and add against the Raiders. So it's unfortunate, but, you know, I don't know if Josh is going to be able to get a handle of it because there are so many things going wrong with this team right now. Um, I, I don't know where the focus overall uh, of this team is right now. You know, I asked Deron Harmon in the locker room following the game, how come what is going on on the practice field, because it is clean on the practice field, you know, the penalties aren't there on the practice field. How come that's not translating when the lights are on and it's game time? Practice is easy. <laughs> it's just <laughs> practice is easy. You go, you can go out there, go through the motions of practice. You can go through practice and sleep. You know your responsibilities because coaches script plays for you to be successful. They don't really challenge you at times, especially this time of the season. So practice is easy. Practice is nothing more than a glorified walkthrough. Well, that's a good segue to what I want to get in on the physicality. You saw the Washington Commanders on Monday Night Football, how physically they were. They won the time of possession. They were just pushing the Eagles around who came in undefeated. And I go back to the Raiders and the Colts. We knew the Colts had a big athletic offensive line. What did you see when it came to the physicality of that game and how the Raiders stood up, you know, man on man with a bigger Colts team? Well, look, the way teams are going, first of all, starting on the Raiders offense, we know when Josh Jacobs is in the backfield and generally there's another backer or there looks like a power look, the Raiders are going to probably try to run. 
what the Colts did, just like other teams did, they brought an extra person down the box, usually a safety. And it's up to the receivers, whether it's Mac Hollins or Devontae Holliday, I mean Devontae Adams, uh, to come, go in there and try to dig that receiver out, whether motion or tight motion. So the Raiders have tried to implement that. And it's just a crumb, you know, it was a cluster box. There was really no definitive holes for the Raiders to establish a running game. Josh Jacobs did as much as he could. And a lot of times he was making people miss in the backfield. Those errors you know, slow, slow down the running game. And so you've got to get those things corrected. You got to have an answer for that on the defensive side. Look, Max Crosby is playing at an all out level. He's playing at a, 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 as an all pro, possibly defensive MVP level, but he can't do it alone. So when he's crashing down and trying to get guys from the backside or they're trying to trap him, somebody else has got to stand up. There were times there had some internal pen penetration that were, that was able to help and force Jonathan Taylor out there. But this style of defense guys, when you're covering up all the offensive linemen with Patrick Graham's defense, whether it's defensive ends, five defensive ends, or five defensive linemen across the board, and you have that thin linebacker core, there's no one left after there. And that's why Jonathan Taylor broke that 64-yard run, because when Harmon came down to try to take the angle away, he, he mistimed it. He didn't judge Jonathan Taylor's speed, and that's how Taylor's able to get on the outside. But you talk about the over-physical nature overall for the, uh, the Raiders' defense. I thought they hung in there as long as they could. It's just they getting off to a slow start, being exposed out there. They got worn down like most defenses do in the fourth quarter. All right, Lincoln, we're going to play Derek Carr. Clearly very emotional after the game. We know in the locker room we haven't been in there after a game. You played at the highest level. So Derek Carr met the media after the game. Here's what he said. You know, I'm sorry. Derek, um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. Continue. To finish that, sorry for being emotional. I'm just pissed off about some of the things, you know, that a lot of us try and do just to practice. What we put our bodies through just to sleep at night. And for that to be the result of all that effort pisses me off. Lincoln, you can obviously tell the emotion is there for Derek. He loves this team. He loves being a Raider. It's been a big struggle this year into his ninth season. What would you take away from his comments? You know, I appreciate the passion. And, and I expect that from the quarterback. You, you should show passion and emotion like that, especially on a loss that's as disheartening in the way this season is going Look, guys, we came into this season looking on paper and projecting that this team was going to be able to be, be capable of competing with anyone. And to some degree, they have. What they've lacked is inconsistency. What they've lacked is just over time, um, everybody doing their job at the same level at the same time and everything else. So I can appreciate what Derek Carr is going through and, and the sympathy, but the, the, the truth of the matter is that Derek Carr has to accept responsibility for his play comes down to that and and if I was in that position which I'm not but if I had a press conference every week and I would come out as a quarterback as a leader and you know take responsibility I need to do better because that's what every player should be saying to themselves not just Derek Carr but when addressing the media when addressing the Raider Nation every player should be saying I need to play better and they need to put that out there because in fact they all need to play better every single one of them needs to play better if this team is going to be effective when you talk about the, the Raiders and you've talked about the team to me multiple times and us here on the podcast multiple times, you say the team isn't quite a team. There are individuals. When you hear Derek Carr speak like that, is that what you take away? Is that that's individual conversations again? Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, here's the thing, you, you know, to to for, for Derek to come out there and times, you know, the one instance in the, in the Colts game for him to try to force the ball downfield to Devontae Adams when he was triple triple covered unnecessary. Mm. That's a waste of play. Don't force it. Don't do things like that. I know that, look, you've got a great relationship. I understand he's a great athlete, but there are things, there are decisions that you have to make as a quarterback and leading this team. You can't avoid to have those miscues. you got to do something different. So don't try to force it just because the coach says or calls it up. Don't try to force it. Those are things that individuals need to do better. And when you're out there, you're talking collectively like an offensive line. If you know it's fourth down and short or whatever, you know, and you're going to try to do a trick play to get outside or a little sweep, that perimeter has got to be blocked. Devontae Adams, you got to block that, that corner. That's your responsibility. We don't get this first down. You don't block him. 
And I'm not saying that he missed it on purpose. I'm not trying to call out guys. I'm just saying this is individual efforts that can go on in every play. If you want write up and judge every play, grade every play, and there's a miscue or there's a mental error, chances are you're not going to be successful because it takes 11 guys to function at one in order to be successful all the time. All right, Lincoln, I want to stay with that because this is really important. And you got, everyone's got to do their job as best of their ability. But when you don't have Waller and you don't have Renfro for this long of a time period and you're having backups in who are capable, that's got to have an effect on Derek at some point. He's worked tirelessly with these guys over the last couple of years, and he has two of the greatest seasons in Raiders history, in the history of this franchise, with Waller and Renfro individually. So I look at that. Could that be getting to Derek, knowing that he needs those guys back under any circumstance? I understand if they can't go, they can't go. But is that the level of frustration? You can't go to Devontae on every play. Moreau can make a play here and there. At times, Hollins doesn't run the right route, or it's not precise enough. And those two players are really hurting the team with their inability to play. Well, that's absolutely right. And, and look, as, as I said earlier, coming on paper, we expected a lot more. But for whatever reason, it is what it is. So this is where it falls on coaching to me, guys. You, A, a coach has got to find a way to utilize what he has available to the best of their ability. Okay? You know, there's no reason for Cole crossing the middle to drop a pass that's right in his hands. You get his opportunity to catch the ball. He's wide open in the middle of the field. He drops the ball. There's no reason for that. You're right about Morel not being able to run the routes, you know, run the routes as ac accurately as other, but timing. If that's the case, if this is what we're dealing with, a depleted receiving core, a depleted tie in, tight end core, you've got to find creative ways of getting the ball down the field and moving the ball. That's what coaching falls on coaching. And, and then you have to implement that to your players. You have to go in there and in my, and if I was coach and I'm not saying I'm not, I don't want the position, trust me, <laughs> but if I was coach, I would go into Derek and say, what do you like? What plays do you like? Okay. You get that, you get that down. And then you say, well, who do you like to go to? Okay. Well, let's try to figure out how we can get the ball this way. The fact is, in my opinion, guys, the fact is, is that Derek holds on the ball far too long, far too long to try to get plays down the field. He stands firm in the pocket. I can appreciate that. But there are times where he uses his feet to extend plays to get guys open, and he has it. What sets him apart is his accuracy and his arm strength. That, to me, sets Derek Carr's part. What, to me, is sometimes a minus is his decision-making and lack of sense of urgency. Lincoln, looking at the defensive side of things, uh, I thought that one of the biggest plays of the game was Darian Butler not coming up with that fumble, and it looked like he was trying to oh. pick it up, scoop and score instead of just falling on it. I heard you on the call, fall on it, fall on it. How massive was that 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 play wasn't executed correctly? It was huge. And, and look, you can't, you can't fault a guy for trying. Right. He doesn't know what's around him. Obviously, he feels that he, he has a complete, he can pick it up, scoop and score. You, you can't mind that. But here's the thing. You, defenders need to be mindful. Once you get a football or a turnover, secure the ball because they're coming back after it. So that should be first and foremost. And every, every coach I've ever been around where you're taught to turnover drill and everything, secure the football first. Make sure you have the football first and you're holding on the football tightly because these other guys around you are going to come, come and try to take it away. So, I mean, it was, it was a missed opportunity. And obviously the, the way that the, the Colts – um, uh, you know, got together after that. They scored rather quickly because they didn't want to leave anything up to interview or review or anything like that or interpretation. So, you know, the, the defense has got to respond. And that's another thing, you know, that I, I would have liked Patrick Graham to call a timeout in that estimation to after the play to get his guys realigned because the coach went right back at it and they threw a quick slam for a touchdown. All right, Lincoln, let's jump into some of the younger players on defense and what you saw because that's what we're dealing with now with 12 players on IR tied for third in the league. It's next man up, yeah. and it's been like that for quite some time here. And it's going to happen on the defensive side, too, as some of these younger players are going to get a look here so Dave Ziegler can make a decision on their status going forward. It pains me to say this. It really does this team does not have the players to implement the systems that they have in place on both sides of the ball. Um, and I, I, I hate to say that because it's midway through the season. We had such high hopes and promise, but you can't play the style of defense with these players. You don't have good enough linebackers. And I know Denzel Perryman was, wasn't, didn't, was a scratch um, overall in order to play the style of defense. You have to have linebackers move sideline to sideline. You don't have that. You don't have corners that can cover one-on-one. And, and even in zone, they're, they're so cautious, they give up space, so much of a cushion, it's easy pitch and catch. 
Um, on offense, no, not enough tight ends, not enough receivers, not enough offensive line. It's it's a struggle. So on the defensive side, to answer your question, JT, yeah, next man up. And you're going to see effort, but you're also going to see, you know, where you're you're outmanned. And if the if if things don't become more balanced as far as time of possession for this team, the, the defense especially is going to be extremely fatigued in the fourth quarter. Lincoln, going back to that play that I talked about with Darian Butler not picking up the fumble, the guy who caused the fumble was Sam Webb, undrafted free agent. He's a guy yeah. who made the 53-man roster. He made a couple plays on Sunday. Again, are you looking for positives? Uh, do you see some good things from young uh, Sam Webb? Yeah, I mean, put in that position, you make the best of your opportunities. And and, and I think Sam has, has done that. And we need more of that. Uh, and I'm not saying, like, it's impossible to happen, guys. Right. Let's just let's – just, but let's put it in perspective. There's a reason why a guy might go undrafted. There's a reason why a guy might be a free agency. There, there's a reason why a guy might be cut or might not be deemed as a starter on another team. There's a reasons for that. And I'm not saying that these guys aren't capable, but, but IR has hurt this team, mm -hmm. as you guys have talked about. And more importantly, just the overall, what, whatever's going on in that locker room has hurt this team because it's it's, it's still been inconsistent. The, the Colts, as you, and I'm sure you guys will agree, the Colts were a team the Raiders should have beat. Yeah. Should have beaten. For sure. There's no reason why they didn't. I mean, they came up short again, but we could say that about the last couple of weeks. They should have beat the Jacksonville Jaguars. They stink. They should have beat the New Orleans Saints. They stink. So where are we at now? Yeah. Lincoln, let's go to the linebackers. This is an issue here that's really important here. Look who's not in and look who's getting their opportunities to play. And the Blake Martinez retirement, I get that. Divine hopefully is coming back healthier. Denzel Perryman is a discussion going forward. Jayon Brown has had multiple opportunities to prove himself. I think that's a question mark. I like Masterson and what he can do. And Butler, again, he's got to make smart decisions, good plays. But at this point, I think the middle of the field being so open, we're realizing that they struggle guarding tight ends over the middle of the field. And I'd like to just see yes. them play more physical. I'd like to see a violent brand of Raider football at any position. So when you see the cushion from the corners in zone coverage, why is there an eight or nine yard cushion? Why aren't they putting their hands on people and trying to be physical with them? I understand if they get beat. If you get beat by Tyreek Hills, now a dolphin, he's gone. So you're not going to catch up to him again. Hmm. But some of these tight ends and some of these receivers who aren't pro bowlers, I'm just surprised that the defenders aren't getting an opportunity to play tougher coverage and become more physical. How do you see that? Well, you got to be cautious, JT, because in the past games, we've seen when the corners and the, and the defensive backs collectively have been physical, we've had illegal use of the hands. Okay. We've had holding. We've had defensive pass interference. We've had automatic first downs in those instances. And so I think that has made them a little bit leery collectively. But also, I, I think it's just a fear of being beaten deep. I mean, it, overall, it's being beaten deep. You, even when you go with the two safety si system, and a lot of teams that what which lightens up the box that exposes your undersized linebackers that exposes them to offensive line play and tight end play in the run game. You know, the, the popular rule was if you see a two high safety, you run the ball. If you see a single high safety, you throw the ball. And if you have a single high safety, who's playing more like a center fielder, there's a lot of real estate for these defensive backs to cover on multiple receiver sets and split out tight ends who are athletic and everything like that. So there's a lot of space that needs to be contained. That's why I went back to the statement. They don't have the personnel to play this style of defense. Well, they can speak of the personnel, and we know it's evaluation season right now. Uh, the Raiders picked up Jerry Tillery from the Chargers. They waived him last week. They picked him up. He's got 10.5 career sacks. I don't know what he's going to bring to the table. I'm sure nobody does just yet, but just having that addition, what do you think he, uh, he can do to help this defense? Tillery has abused the Raiders in the past from the defensive tackle standpoint, especially when having uh, ends that are capable. So if you can get a one-on-one -on -one isolated with a guard, he can have an advantage. I, I expect that when they try to go to their pass package or their pass defense package and they, they open it up with just four diva, defensive linemen, you know, with Chandler Jones and Max Crosby in there and those guys, you could probably try to open up some things, some instances where he can run good games with those guys and be able to generate pressure. Lincoln, from last year to this year, do you like the rotation from the tackles? Because last year it was kind of a strength, even though the Raiders didn't set records with defense under Gus Bradley. That rotation, there were guys fighting to be the fifth, sixth, seventh defensive lineman on the field here. It's getting a little thin here. That's why they made this move here. But what do you think of the rotation and the playing time overall? 
I think it's absolutely a necessity these days. The way, especially as as porous as the Raiders' defense has been, and as long drives they've been giving up to opposing offenses, you got to have a rotation. You got to be able to keep guys fresh because there's going to be times where you know whether it's play action or drop back pass in a third down and long situation where you're going to ask these guys to get some pressure. And if they're out there being pushed around a bunch, they're not going to have the legs to do that. Lincoln, did it look to you like Patrick Graham really tried to simplify the defense and then Matt Ryan being the veteran that he is, the pro that he is, was able just to kind of pick them apart and not have any problem, uh, you know, diagnosing what the Raiders were trying to do defensively? Well, yeah. I mean, but we've also seen this this sort of map to defend, to take on the Raiders' defense, you know, you you with that wide open space, you see a lot of teams throwing slant routes. That hasn't stopped. You see a lot of teams when they're playing zone, they're backing up. They're just doing stop and hitch routes, taking soft cushions in the middle of the field. That hasn't stopped. More importantly, when you uh, give a good, healthy dose of run, you're going to suck in the linebackers and, and everyone else. And then you've got a lot of real estate over the middle for play action, or even you're on one on one uh, deep down the field with a single high safety. So we've seen that formula time and time again. No. No surprise to me what was surprising like i said earlier is to see matt ryan running the rpo <laughs> right. because i you know i i would never think in a, in a million years and neither did raiders defense that matt would keep the football and that's why when he did nobody was turned around the defensive line was uh, was occupied with blocks the secondary was occupied with their responsibilities nobody paid attention to number two running down the field till he was 20 yards behind the line of scrimmage Lincoln, last one. Let's get to Denver. I'm excited about this. I am excited about the opportunity to sweep the Broncos. And that's what the Raiders did to Vic Fangio. He was no longer there. It's been a while since Denver got a W. And the Raiders have the ability, if they're this upset and they're chirping, and there's a couple of players that want to see more out of others, you would think going into an AFC West rival, those Denver fans right on top of the Raiders, you know that better than anyone with you and your career there, Talk about yeah. something positive here on how the Raiders can sweep the Broncos, get Ru get Russell Wilson down, and get a win and start building something here the second half of the season. Well, through two coaching staffs, it changes, if you will, the Raiders have had the Broncos number, which yeah. is good for them as far as confidence. They have a formula of success to how to beat the Broncos. They showed it earlier this year and they even showed it last year. So I think that is a positive going forward. And in, in the opportunity to talk about what you were, you were mentioning, JT, about being upset, if there's any better opportunity, it's the next game up. And this is not an impossible feat to say that the Raiders should beat the Broncos. And I, I can go out there and make that statement. They say should beat the Broncos. Like I said, they should have beat a number of the teams. They just have to go out and do it. But it's going to take consistency and it's going to take, you know, overcoming the mental errors and the lack of e execution uh, from all sides, whether it be the coaching staff down to the players and every player that's viable that's going to be suiting up this weekend. It's going to be cold. It's going to be a hostile environment, but I feel the Raiders have a good chance to come home with a victory. Thank you, Lincoln. We'll talk to you. Safe travels on the way to Denver. Always appreciate you. See you guys. Be well. All right. That's the great Lincoln Kennedy. When we come back, we'll take a look at the upcoming schedule, what's happening around the league, especially in the division in the AFC West. You're listening and watching on YouTube, Raiders Roundtable, brought to you by America First Credit Union. When you're a part of a team, there are expectations. And one of the things I expect from my team is trust. I work hard to win, and I trust my team to work hard too. That's why I feel good about America First Credit Union. They're my financial team and I trust that they'll always be there for me and my community. I'm Hunter Renfro. Join me and the America First team today. 60 years in the making, the Raiders now have a permanent place to call home, and the doors are open to get a world-class behind-the-scenes tour of their new home. An attraction unlike any other in Las Vegas, Allegiant Stadium. The Las Vegas Raiders invite you to experience the expertly guided tour that includes exclusive access to areas restricted to only football players, coaches, and staff. For more information, visit AllegiantStadium.com forward slash tours.
Thanks for coming back to Raiders Roundtable, brought to you by America First Credit Union. Thanks again to Lincoln Kennedy. So, Q, looking at some of these games, the Chargers and the Niner game, man, the Niners gave the Raiders a blueprint in the future yeah. on how to get to the quarterback, Justin Herbert. Raiders have Max Crosby, but Bosa was a beast. And the Chargers were in that game late, and the Niners were able to put them away. Yeah, and the, the Niners' defense was really strong in the second half, right? The Chargers got off to a really good start, but the Niners being able to buckle up and, and really tighten down that defense in the second half gave them an opportunity to do what they wanted to do offensively as well. And so, yeah, the Raiders put or the 49ers put a, a blueprint out there for uh, how to defeat the Chargers. Of course, the Raiders have the Chargers in a couple weeks, but I'll tell you right now, man, if the the Raiders' defense doesn't tighten up, it won't be that easy. They'll have to outshoot them. Yeah, let me make this point again: the luckiest, and it. Was was all luck getting right. Jimmy Garoppolo to stay. Yeah. They wanted nothing they to do wanted with Jimmy. They wanted nothing to do with him. They wanted nothing with Garoppolo. They yes. were begging for someone to take him yep. for anything, anything, and they didn't. Yep. And it saved the season for it, the Niners. It really did. And and at the end of the season, they're going to have probably tough decisions to make. But, yeah, I mean, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, and that's exactly what happened with San Francisco. And the situation. Chargers, to give them credit, they compete hard. They have so many injuries. Yeah, they, they do. do. They're losing their top two wide receivers, and they put up a fight there. But the Niners are good. The Niners have – Pro Bowl players and yep. really good starters at every aspect of that defense and on the offense. Let's and we'll see them sooner enough. Oh, right? no doubt we'll about it. We'll see them that's, at Allegiant Stadium on New Year's. That's a big one. Let's move to the Jaguars at the Chiefs. The Raiders lose to the Jaguars, and the Raiders dominated them the first half of that game. I thought the Chiefs just took care of business. Mm -hmm. They did what they were supposed to do, Q, and that's a sign of a championship team or a contender. Just go out there and beat the teams you got to beat right. on your schedule. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. You look at those schedules, and, and yeah, you're right. You look at the ones that, that you know that you're supposed to beat, and the Raiders are more talented than the Jaguars. As Lincoln said in the last segment, I mean, the Raiders are more talented than a lot of teams that they lost to. You're supposed to beat the teams that you know you're supposed to beat, and then you have the 50-50 games. And if you take your chances there and you win even 50% of those, you're looking good at the end of the season. The Raiders just a couple up short this season. Yeah, I think the Jaguars looking at that game. That's the top of the entire AFC, right. especially what's happening with the Bills. Mm -hmm. And the Jaguars are no longer at the bottom right. of the AFC. It was a good measuring stick for them to yeah. see where they're at, right? I mean, you, you feel like that they're going to be a better team under Doug Peterson. You feel like Trevor Lawrence is going to be better. You saw what ETN is able to do. So it's a good measuring stick for the Jaguars, but the Chiefs are clearly the better team. There. And let's move on to the Broncos. Put up a fight against the Titans at the Titans. What was interesting to me in that game was the fact that, you know, you look at the Denver defense, the Raiders are the only team to score over 30 on them at 32. No other team, no other team in the NFL has scored over 19 on the Broncos. So the Bronco defense minus Chubb, right. they're a team that still plays firm defense, and we know how good their secondary is. They're very disciplined, especially in the secondary, right? Pastor Tan is fantastic. He's a young dude who's going to be around for a very long yes. time. But you know that they have – Good discipline on defense, and so they're tough against every single team. But to your credit, the Raiders, you know, were able to score 30 plus points against them. And you know, obviously, that they had other weapons out there. This is going to be interesting this upcoming week without a Waller, without a Renfro. You know, and can Matt Collins and Derek Carr get on the same page? That's really been the biggest thing with mm -hmm. Carr and Hollins. You mentioned it earlier, Hollins doesn't seem to run the route exactly the way it's supposed to be ran. And sometimes you see Carr kind of chirping at him a little bit, hey, continue to run or go a little bit further. It just seems like they're just off a little bit. But I think the key to this game is going to be is Denver hasn't had a good plan all year. Mm -hmm. The Raiders, I think, have had a really good plan. They're just not executing it. No, How no. many times have we Get talked about that? Yeah. That's completely the opposite of the Broncos. The Broncos are being questioned. I was on Broncos radio earlier this week, and they had me on to talk about the difference of the team, and I said that Denver hasn't been close early. They've mm -hmm. just been a mess, right. and they're trying to stabilize now. And I think Nathaniel Hackett with the three and six team, that's one game ahead of the Raiders. He just wants to tell his ownership and everyone that my plan, look, I beat the Raiders. My right. plan is in place. Mm -hmm. Give me another year because the heat is on him yeah. if it just looks like they're not getting better from game to game. And I thought they were better against the Titans. They were physical. No, they were. They were. And and they're playing for their coach, even though it seems like their coach may not have a 100% plan right now. I mean, it looks like that he has a plan, but it's, it, like you said, it's not really executing and he's trying to show ownership that the plan is, is going to get better. I don't know if it's going to get better. I think Nathaniel Hackett could be one of those guys that, you know, at the end of the season they're talking about, is he staying, is he not staying? I mean, that's for the, the Denver to decide, but 
It, it's it's just kind of weird there. If you asked me a month ago, I loved this schedule. Right. I didn't like it. I loved it. Yeah, and yeah. the Raiders dropping the three games the teams they were supposed to beat. Denver, they're looking for the sweep. Uh, mm-hmm. Seattle is 6-4, and four, and I think they're playing better than anybody expected. Absolutely. I think that's a winnable game. You might think yeah. I'm crazy. That's Geno. Right. Okay? That is not John Elway and Joe Montana in his right. prime. The Chargers come here, and that's a rivalry game. Anything could happen. And the Rams, we talked about it before the podcast. Cooper Cup could be gone for the year. He's on IR. There's no need to risk Cooper, Cooper Cup. No. and bring him back to that game if you think you can further injure him if he plays and does it again. So the Raiders should be able to win a few of these games. I'm not predicting all of them, Q, right. but I'm encouraged that the Raiders, after this week and all the chirping and all the noise from the national media right. leading up to the Jeff Saturday game, the Colts winning the game, this is put up or shut up time for the Raiders. They really have to play with pride and poise. They really do. And it feels like a lot of these games have been games that they definitely could win. I mean, we looked at the schedule and said, okay, this is the the leaner part of the schedule. Not saying that these are gimme games. There's no gimme game in the NFL. But you felt pretty good about the Raiders' chances. And I still feel good about their chances. But it's only if they execute. That's only if they don't get behind the sticks. It's only if they don't shoot themselves in the foot. I mean, really, a lot of these losses, JT, are on them. I think this is the most important week of practice. I mean, the record shows what they are. You are what your record is. But this is the week that the captains, the coaches, the last player on the 53-man roster, the practice squad players got to come into this building and dedicate themselves and say, we're playing for the fans. We have a rivalry game against the Broncos. From Al Davis to Mark Davis, they always want to beat the Broncos. They want to beat everybody. But this one's a big one. For Q Myers, I'm JT. Thanks again to Lincoln Kennedy. And we appreciate you joining us on Raiders Roundtable.